this one eleven class, and we have uh, invited uh, <coughs> Professor Singh to come in and give us a lecture. Uh, we are the Affirmative Action Committee of PCC, and uh, Dr. Singh will be introduced by my colleague, Mr. Ben. Right. Uh, again, my name is Rex Bay Penn, um, and thank you so much for letting us into your class. Uh, we're both part of the Affirmative Action Committee. You're probably wondering what is the Affirmative Action Committee. It's basically a committee on campus that advocates for minorities in terms of job searches, um, especially with search committees, and also for cultural events. So the last Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, it's a mouthful, was uh, last year. So this is our second annual event. Um, so thank you for joining us, and thank you, Dr. Adams, for allowing us in your class. Uh, Dr. Singh, Paul Ram Singh, is from UMass Dartmouth, as you have heard. Uh, he actually was a professor since 1990, so over like 22 years of service to UMass Dartmouth. Um, and he's in the biophysical chemistry research uh, department at UMass. And there's an entire building, actually, research building, starting in 2007, brand new building dedicated to Dr. Singh and his research for the military. So he's a well-renowned researcher and also yoga instructor, director of index studies, uh, you name it, he does everything. Uh, so uh, I won't take any more time, Dr. Singh. Thank you very much, Rakshmi. I mean, I, I got educated myself. I did not know there is a, such a thing like Asian American Pacific, Asian Pacific American month. It's, those of you who do not know, actually it's next month from what I understand. But since there are finals and the students are gone, so it doesn't make any sense to have a program. Uh, so they are doing it for this month, which is really a wonderful thing. So I, I got educated myself. I'm going to give you a, a peek into what goes into someone living 12,000 miles away to come here and, and uh, do the American way of life, education, and then succeed, and then think back. So I've been here for 30 years approximately, and a lot of journey. My family lives here. My close family lives here. My extended family still lives in India. And so I'm, I'm going to try to give you a, a sense of what someone goes through. And hopefully, there will be some lessons for you, and uh, some inspirations for you, and some understanding for you. And we'll try to give you a, what I'm trying to now give back from uh, uh, whatever I've been able to gain in last so many years. So the first thing is to see what, I mean, Asian, Asian Pacific is really this, this area, um, which is really a very large area. You know, do you know what Asian means? Anyone? Asian means the other side. That's what Europeans call people from the other side, whatever they meant at that point. It may have, they, may, they may have meant the other side of Himalayas. They may have meant the other side, people who look different, whatever that is. Asian literally means the other side. But this is really a, a huge place, especially India, China, Indonesia, and others uh, involved in this. It's, it's a very large part of the, the world, and it's becoming more and more important. Uh, it has been very, very important, many of you may not be knowing, in history, and I was also not knowing, but it's definitely becoming more and more important. One of the things, of course, I'm, uh, as Rexman, Rexman came from um, Cambodia, somewhere around there. I came from India. And it looks like we all immigrated. This may actually look like you know, this is all the immigration uh, route of all these people. But this is actually a genetic map of how the humanity developed. The, 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 we all know that humans evolved from Africa. But they, they went from Africa. The, nobody has really got, gone to uh, anywhere else from Africa except they went to India. And from India. Everywhere you see the, all these people, everywhere, including Europe, they all genetically, this is a genetic map that people have found now, now doing population genetics, and have found that all of us are. Of course, our uh, forefathers are from here, 
But after that, everybody is from India or South Asia or that part of the world. Generically, we are all in connected. So this is really a map that is going on for 60, 70,000 years. This is not the map that is recent one. Now, I, my journey is I'm from a village, a, a very, very tiny village in a very remote area. And this is a picture of 1990 when I visited. This is, this used to be, he used to be my classmate in, in primary school. And this is my family. This is how they, you know, they didn't have chairs and tables. They still, a lot of culture, they use this kind of carts that they call them. And uh, those are my two brothers. The oldest one, he's passed away now, actually, and he's still, his end and his kids. And they worked uh, in the fields. This is, they're just trying to prepare something for the, for the cattle. And, and then a person like me appears very different, you know, looks very different. But this is really, this is, is my family still lives together. They, all these family members, they still live in one house. All, they, you know, my oldest brother is not there, but his son and his son's son, and my other brother is there, and his son and his uh, son's kids, they all live together in, in one, one house. And this is the house now. It looks, you know, we have built a very nice house, actually. Um, can you turn off the light? Maybe you can see if Kim gives a better picture. Just the front, maybe, yeah. So this is the same, uh, in front of the same house, but now it's really we have built a, a, a relatively large house. Most Asians and Indians, particularly when they come here, and if they are well-to-do, they build a house in one of the cities, and then you know not in the villages. I have not done that. I have just built a very nice house, uh, relatively speaking, in the village. And so much so that there is a professor from my campus, Maureen Hall, who got her Fulbright. I have a small school in my village. And this is the guest house of that school. And so she actually went and she was able to stay in that house from here. So it's, it's, a, it's a reasonably uh, um, well built and the facilities are there. But people are still, you can see their, their cattle, and this is all just fields, farming. My family is a farming family. This is where I actually, the travel for me from my village to Delhi was much uh, more difficult than travel from Delhi to United States. I had to do a lot of adjustments. So coming from a very small village, I had to adjust a lot. So I went to a university called Jawaharlal Nehru University, and it is a, it's considered Harvard of India. It's like a, I was just lucky to get in, in into that. And this is a, the, their library now. And I was inside. Before coming to this country, you know, can't probably recognize me. That's me. And, and then I, I landed in Texas Tech, which is in Lubbock, Texas, where uh, my wife joined me about a year later and uh, my daughter, along with my daughter. And uh, this is my advisor, Pil Soon Song, who was of Korean origin. And uh, there were some issues to adjust. Well, first of all, you know, there are some obvious things that you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't even think of. India and United States are opposites of the globe. Well, you would say, well, that's kind of, OK, we understand that's just a geography. But you wouldn't believe that in India, people drive on the left. Here, they drive on the right. People, you know, the switches, here you turn off on the switch by turning up, there it's down. It's like, you know, peculiar things that, that is so much, so not only day and night here and there. There, people um, normally live in larger family. Here, normally people live in a small, smaller family. It's just like a lot of things to, food was a, one of the issues. The, in India, people have all sorts of, food and people in the, within a family have different food habits and it is well accepted. Here it is difficult. You know when I first time my advisor, very nice man, he used to take the whole group, research group, all the PhD students to a pizza party every week and I didn't eat beef and they didn't know that. So when he ordered and then I asked what kind of meat is it, and then said it's pepperoni, and I, I didn't know what pepperoni is, so I asked, what is pepperoni? Somebody said it's beef. I said, I can't eat that. 
And my advisor was like red-faced because he ordered this pizza <laughs> and then I'm not eating it. <laughs> so I said, I can only eat vegetarian. Actually, more importantly, I, he took me to a Carlsbad cavern, if anyone of you know that is in New Mexico, the biggest cavern in this country. And then while coming back, there was a Japanese professor and he was there and I was there and they stopped at a steakhouse. I have no idea what a steak is. <laughs> so he asked me, you know, what type of steak you want. I thought it's some kind of food. I said, he, I said what choices do I have? He said, it's a rare. Well done or very well done? I said, I'll have very well done. So, because coming from India, everything is cooked very, 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 very nicely. So, when it came, it smelled different. I used to eat chicken and other things. When I smelled, it smelled different. I asked him, what is this? He said, it's beef. I said, I can't eat beef. I can imagine it was $20 at that time. He was really, really mad at me. But I said, <laughs> I, said I cannot eat. So, you know, these are the things that you, you face when you come here. The simple thing, you say you are Indian. In you know, that part of the country, there are a lot of Indians in this part of the country. They think that you are uh, Native, Indian, Native American. And then they, you know, we still get a lot of letters soliciting support for um, Native Americans or American Indians. I mean, this is kind of very confusing. We are known as Indian Americans, and they are known as American Indians. So it's like so much confusion. We, you have to deal with all that. And I, I finished my PhD in chemistry and then moved to the University of Wisconsin. And you, know, you can't really appreciate this picture. This is all uh, Lake Mendota, which is frozen. So we are walking on Lake Mendota. It's like uh, two feet uh, ice. People do uh, ice fishing and all that. So I, by then, of course, I had my second daughter. And, and it was wonderful, except my wife didn't like that cold weather. And so when we came here, it was 20 degrees warmer compared to Madison, Wisconsin. And she said, we are not moving from here anywhere else. <laughs> Actually, this is true. She's, I wanted to move out after a couple of years. She said, no, we are staying. She really liked the area. She liked the Portuguese community because they're also very family oriented. So she felt very comfortable. She thought that was a, a, a good idea, and we, go, we stayed here. Now I want to tell you a little bit of work that I do. Uh, I got introduced to this work when I was in uh, University of Wisconsin. Before University of Wisconsin, I used to work on plants, plant proteins. And in University of Wisconsin, I started working on this uh, something called botulinum neurotoxin. It's probably many of you have not heard. Anyone have heard? Anyone of you other than Raksme, of course, you may have. Uh, have you have heard about tetanus, right? So botulinum toxin, you have not heard, but you have heard about Botox. Botox comes from botulinum toxin, Botox. So Botox is really, this is the same thing as the Botox. So I got introduced. Of course, this is a very toxic material, botulinum toxin, number one toxin. If you compare with sodium cyanide, it's 100 billion times more toxic than sodium cyanide. If you think of a cobra or some toxins, it's about a million times more toxic than a cobra toxin or the snakes which is like very commonly people are scared in, in Asian countries. There are a lot of snakes and people are very concerned about. So this is very, uh, very active molecule. And I got introduced to this and then took upon to myself to develop it further. And so I moved with the project to uh, uh, UMass Dartmouth. This is a biothreat agent. It's always in the news. It's, it's considered class A biothreat agents. Bioterrorists could use it. And one of the problems with this is why it is very uh, scary in addition to being toxic. When it is so toxic, you need only tiny, very tiny amount of this. So it's very difficult to detect. It's a food poison. Originally, it's a food poison. All you need is uh, some billionth of a gram will be enough to kill a person. So but the second problem with this is that once you get sick with it, you will be in hospital for weeks because it survives in your body for weeks. So you will be in ICU. The, there are only about 100 cases. They're not very common disease in this country or in the world, actually. There may be a couple hundred cases throughout the world. But if people do get sick, if they get botulism, let's say somebody uh, poisons your milk supply or some salad or something like that, a terrorist, then in that case, if there are 1,000 people get sick, half of IC units in this country will be engaged to take care of them. There are only 2,000 IC <coughs> units in this country. So that means that nobody else will get an opportunity. And that's why really people are very concerned. 
Now this is also like I said it is a Botox. So it is a, it's a medicine. No, normally you, you all knew about tetanus because you get tetanus shots. Botulinum is a cousin of tetanus. It is called Clostridium botulinum. It produces botulinum. Clostridium tetani produces tetanus. So it is like very similar. You can produce, we can produce vaccine against botulinum but nobody wants to be vaccinated because if you get vaccinated then this will not, you cannot use as a, as a medicine. And there are of course people know Botox, what, what do they use Botox for? Wrinkles, anything else? Yeah, the same thing. See most people know for wrong reasons. The Botox is used for 132 neuromuscular disorders. Nothing to do with, of course, everybody knows because of wrinkles. Of course, 50 percent of this, this is two and a half billion dollar industry. It started in 1990. That time they were thinking it will be only 20 million dollars maximum. It's two and a half billion dollar industry growing at 20 percent. There are only five to six million people right now getting Botox. There are seven billion people. Now, this is used against migraine headache. You know, some people have excessive sweating. Some people have, uh, it initially it was really discovered for cross eye disease which is you know you are looking somewhere else and it looks like you are looking somewhere else. And uh, the, like I said 130, people who cannot digest food sometimes you can do, give it to them. The, there are um, people get you know the, when you type too much or you play music then you get dystonia or some people cannot stop shaking their head, Parkinson's disease because there's people are shaking and it, it just it, it is it is not a cure for anything it just only treats the symptoms but nevertheless 132 neuromuscular disorders a recent paper has suggested that it may be a good treatment for depression so can you imagine that this how far this is going to go it's it's a very 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 important i'm i'm very fortunate to be working with this not only because it's so important everybody know when I tell them they got, get impressed but also this is very interesting molecule to understand even evolution of matter and so something like that we are working in our lab. Of course you know the politicians use this they, they mostly know uh, for, the, for the wrinkles. Now the Rex may just mention a little bit about the, the research that we do we have uh, a Botulinum Research Center which is international, has international collaborations with different countries, also has all kind of uh, federal agencies that we work with throughout the country. There are many, many labs which work with us because we have such an expertise in one place. And so UMass Dartmouth actually is internationally famous uh, because of Botulinum Research. There is no such one place where this kind of work goes anywhere in the world. The, in universities there is only other place that happens this kind of work is the University of Wisconsin where I got training. But we have done fairly well and there are so many aspects of it that we do a structure function which is my basic interest and then we do, we are developing inhibitors or antidotes against it because we cannot vaccinate people and we do diagnostics, we develop vaccines and then now medical applications. Actually we have about uh, 10 patents, UMass Dartmouth holds, we hold through UMass Dartmouth about 10 patents and um, trying to make better Botox, second or third generation Botox which will be cleaner and will have less effect. Botox by the way has black box label from FDA which is the highest dangerous label that FDA can give because there are some side effects. Some people die, kids particularly, they, they have cerebral palsy, there is not really much uh, medicine, medical um, treatment for cerebral palsy but this uses to treat the symptoms but sometimes they, use, they have to use heavy uh, large doses and in that case sometimes there are deaths, uh, about 16 deaths in last five years or so. So uh, FDA has labeled this as a black box which means we have room to develop it further and make better medication. And uh, we get Every year we, are, we have been since 2007, we have been uh, inviting uh, th from throughout the world, it's an invitation only symposium that we have at UMass Dartmouth, uh, a symposium this is for 2009, we have been, we are going to do it again in uh, August, every August we do this and uh, we get 
people from all over different various agencies including military and, and uh, homeland security and CDC and NIH. Also we get, you know, this speaker was from Japan for example, we get the speakers from throughout the world also. So this gives uh, us, uh, my students, a lot of exposure. You know, they really know they are on top of the world in terms of what is going on in the field. We also publish a journal. I'm editor of that. It's a botulinum journal, the only journal uh, dedicated to this issue. And we have funding, not for the journal, but funding for our research comes from DOD, Army, the Detroit just Army uh, organization. This is also Army organization. This is also Army organization. You would not be surprised, obviously, because they're interested. In, but we also work with the NIH and industry, some of the industry who make Botox or Botox-like like things and the Homeland Security. It's, it's, a, it's a long process. When I started in 1990, uh, we had almost nothing and actually I borrowed a technician from University of Wisconsin. He came and spent his Christmas time over with me and uh, helping us working. And then we, this was my first graduate student, Suhai B, and we were working at that time. And this actually from Fall River, uh, this, this girl who as an undergraduate worked uh, with botulinum talks and created some um, diagnostics. And uh, this was my first PhD student from Taiwan. And this was a postdoc. Uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit later picture, probably in 2000 or so. So we have, we have been working, basically what I'm trying to say is we have been working with graduate students, undergraduate students, technicians, and postdocs to build this program. And uh, I've been active. This, the lower picture shows that when we got this center grant with Tufts University that we had uh, this, is a, this is a large group of people, and everybody is not exactly from my group, but I think uh, two-thirds of them are. My group is fairly large, 20, 25 people work in this. And uh, the top one is the point I wanted to show now that I have my research, is that's all I probably wanted to discuss in terms of research, unless you have, you have questions. I'm also active on campus right from the beginning about the governance, about you know, what happens in the university, how the university progresses, especially about research. And so I know you are getting Jim Higia uh, later on this. He's, he was, of course, a colleague from history department. And I, he was on the panel that I organized at that time as to what we should do to enhance research. And sometimes this is adversarial because actually I organized this called Research Discussion Forum. And I invited the chancellor at that time, Peter Cressy. And you know, he was kind enough, and many other administrators came. But it wasn't exactly fun for them, because it was organized by a faculty. And so we were questioning a lot of things to them. And they had to kind of answer. Uh, something similar I'm going to do um, on April 22nd. There is a book written, The Falling of the Faculty and Rise of All Administrative University. Falling of the Faculty and Rising of All Administrative University written by a professor from Johns Hopkins, we are going to have a discussion of the role of faculty in, in having a, a university uh, education system, who, who controls, whether it's the administrator's control. And the chan I will be inviting chancellor. I haven't sent her the invitation. I will be sending her today invitation. So it is going to be another. What I'm trying to say with this is that where you are active as a faculty, we are not just uh, teachers. We have a role to play in setting up the curriculum, setting up the programs, moving the university forward, and sometimes it is not uh, a fun thing to do because you have adversarial, if, uh, adversarial roles that happens within the university, particularly when you deal with the administrator. Most of the time, the goals are the same. So we may have just differences about how to go about it. But this kind of uh, event so that uh, a faculty has a a different kind of roles that plays, and, and sometimes you don't make friends with, with doing something like that. This is, for example, my research group. I just wanted to, to give you a sense of who those are. Now, of course, we do all this kind of research and you know, some role in the university in governance and all that, but we also have fun. We have, my, my group has, uh, every summer we have a picnic, and this, this year used to be, it just happened to be that it, we did at my backyard. Normally, we go to some places. But we did uh, the picnic, so the whole group and their family, all my group members and their families and everybody get together, maybe 40, 50 people. We, we go out and, and have the whole day uh, a lot of fun. And they bring their 
nieces, nephews, whatever, if they have young children, that also is part of it. And um, what happens that, at least I, I feel very, uh, very strongly that I have a role to play in this area. So since we have certain technology, certain knowledge, certain training, so we have been working on trying to combine uh, education and research with industry and, and try to see if we can make a biotechnology. I know that Fall River is, is having a bio, bio medical park or whatever they call it, biotechnology park or something they are, they are building. Uh, this, uh, if we, we have an opportunity, we will be working with them as well. But the idea is that biotechnology industry, now we have fisheries around here or the mills, but you know, high-tech industry is not there. Either computing, uh, information technology is not here as much, and biotechnology is upcoming field. So we are working with industry people and trying to help, and there is one major group work, working with us in our center, which um, is valued at hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, that company. And so this will be an opportunity for young people to, to see, and I'm, my, my major interest in that is that they should see how the innovation is, is done, and so that they can think of their own way, and, and since we have an interest in biotechnology, we can help them educate about that. So now I want to go move a little bit as to, by the way, if anybody has any questions or, or comments, feel free to, to interrupt me. This is what I want to say something about now our culture and how we adjust in this country. So this is, this is my daughter. This is, oops. And she was just about two year old. We used to do much, much of the fun stuff inside the house because outside the house, she would look very different. And so it wasn't really that much fun. She didn't have too many friends around. And she was just much younger, of course. So we, I will bring the thermocol from you know, my lab where we get the packings. And then we bring and she will have fun with that. You know, we just put her around. <laughs> and then my wife used to mostly dress up in Indian dress saris. And that will also be very, in those days, actually, uh, very rare. It actually, even today, is not that, that common. So, so many times we will be playing, playing inside because just because my daughter wanted to have fun, but we didn't have really that much people we knew or we could connect with. Uh, and I was just a student. Of course, this is the, the back of my house now. And all these, my, that's my, the, the oldest one you just saw is this one. And uh, my, uh, my son and, and my second daughter, they all grown up and they, they dress up in Indian dress and they go out in Indian dress. Um, and they have a lot of friends of, you know, because they have grown up and they, they kind of know them. So it's much easier for us to do. This is some kind of occasion, which is, which is an occasion for a brother and sister. In India, here you have all kind of days, but there is no brother-sister day. In India, a very important day is for brother and sister bonding. And that's like brother takes a vow to protect the sister, and sister takes a vow to protect the brother. And that, actually, many times you don't even have your real brother and sister. Everybody else becomes brother and sister. And that's, that's very common in, in Asian culture. culture. Uh, normally, here, people have boyfriend, girlfriend, uh, more common there. But there is brother, sister is very common. That relationship is, is very much valued. Uh, so we go to shopping, for example, I think this was Burlington Mall where uh, my family went and visited. And um, this is my daughter, the, the oldest one went to Harvard. She was a RA there. So we went even walking around in Harvard. And I have a, the traditional dress uh, from India. And it's, it's, in, 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 it's much easier, actually, in, in New England because this is more cosmopolitan than if, if I were in Texas or if I were in, in, in Wisconsin. Actually, in Wisconsin, uh, contrary to what I, people think, the Texas probably like weird place. But actually, in Wisconsin, we got asked so many times, when will you go back? It was like very commonly a common question. So when are you going to go back to your country? It's like uh, in Texas, I did not hear that. But in, in Wisconsin, I heard uh, several times. Now, the, the community, I come from Indian communities. Uh, I know, I'm sorry, if many of you cannot read that. It's small letters. But this is based on Pew, Pew Research. They are very well to do. You know, if you, the median family income, is, uh, they have highest. The education is very high. And, and um, is, uh, everything is not in here. But um, their families are very stable, uh, relatively speaking. And 
because they are very cohesive, we still they keep the culture of being together. I still take care of my family back home, even though I don't live there for 30 years, but I still consider my brother's son as my own son. I wouldn't, I tell my son that there is no difference. You are here, they are not here, but I have to take care of them as much as I will take care of my son. Because if, if you remember, I told, showed you my early slide, my, my, my brothers were working very hard in the farm. They never let me work because they wanted me to study. Because they thought that if I will study, I will bring the family up. And so I cannot forget that. I, because I wouldn't be here if they were not like that. My, my father died before I was born. I did not know that I don't have father until seven year old. When I was seven year old, then I realized that I don't have father because it's a joint family. So my uncle was there. For me, he was a father figure. Only when I realized when I was seven year old, I call him something else, not what everybody else calls their fathers. And then only I realized. My mother became widow when she was 26. But she did not remarry because her mother wanted her to remarry. And my mother said, I have three husbands because we were three brothers. She said, I have three husbands to take care. I don't need another one. <laughs> and so you know that, that is the kind of dedication she had. And so I need to re return that back. It's very, very important. Nobody tells me nobody is going to take me to a court if I didn't do it. But it's very important. Uh, there is an unwritten pledge in Asian culture that the family is very, very, very important. And I think it's, um, uh, it's sometimes not understood from, from the, the culture that we live in. So there, is a, there are a lot of stereotypes. You know, you, you, you live with your, I mean, people say, well, you still live with your mother? You know, that doesn't look right to them. There are a lot of stereotypical things come. And, and this, so, so this, is, this is something that really bothered me to the extent that I wanted to do something about it. Uh, I wanted to do, I'm in a university, I wanted to do, I think the education is the best, thing, best way to change things. No other way I find to be better than through education. And so that's why I started thinking of uh, having something in UMass Dartmouth that will educate students and colleagues and the community. And the, the way these things work is that, of course, many times the policies, you know, Obama declared uh, May to be the Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. So then we are having it here. Otherwise, it will be difficult. So you really get things up there. But it gets now you are in a university. So this is, this is what happens. The second label is a academic institutions. And then it becomes in a popular culture. So of course, eventually people will know about the Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Uh, as, as you do more, maybe when you mass Dartmouth will start doing, maybe other people will start doing. And then the people will know. And then the, so there is a, and on, once you know that, then there is stereotypical, maybe sometimes uncomfortable situations, like I told some of the stories about my family or my child or myself, will change. Then because people then goes to the policies, and then it, it keeps churning back and forth. And that's how things happen. But sometimes, uh, if you go to uh, the, the politicians, they say that's not our job. You know, somebody else has to do. And so you, you go to the universities, and you, you build, bring it to the popular media and others. And that's where these things start happening. For those of us who are interested in accurate, relevant, and impactful research on India, for example, and its culture, Integrating all labels of the pyramid I just showed you is very important. So we need to uh, have in the popular media, we do some programs, cultural programs where newspapers cover, and they understand while well, Indian music, classical music, classical dance is very, very sophisticated. Nobody knew. I didn't know it either. But now that you make those presentations, the media starts uh, looking at that way. And also, they will, people will become more familiar with so many other things. There are, of course, activists, the students, especially students, they have uh, an organization uh, where they go to the, the politicians and they bring them and then they educate them, they work with them. <laughs> and that's like kind of thing that, that changes the mindset in the, in the minds of the politicians. And they have the, uh, many of the young Indian Americans, for example, or in this case, it's the British uh, Indian who, once they understand their culture, 
So they, of course, re, they go to regular college and universities and all that. But then once they understand their culture, then they bring it. For example, this is a newsreader for BBC. But once a week, she uh, puts on her Indian dress and reads the news. So this is a, a kind of education then to everybody else. Oh, OK, this is, uh, this is where she is coming from and what that is. By the way, those who, you know, it's very difficult to wear saris if you have anyone of you have tried. But it is becoming very popular at very high level. The, the saris which are sold for $5,000 now these days. And they, like very rich people are, are trying that. You know, there are different kind of designs. So for us, we, we started this Center for Indic Studies at UMass Dartmouth. And it really started because we wanted to have a program, believe it or not, as a faculty, I did not know how to book because I'm in the chemistry department. I wanted to have a program on India. I cannot book even a room because I, as a chemistry professor, it doesn't make any sense to do something on India because I have, for a chemistry, I can book. So we needed to have a student organization to book the room. So even though we wanted to do the program, we can only go to a student association, ask them to book the room, then we can do the program. And that was the, <coughs> excuse me, that was the, uh, the real um, inspiration for us to think about it. I was relatively new at that time. And I said, why should don't we form our own association? I mean, several faculty members of Indian descent, they, they said, well, we don't have association of faculty. We have faculty federation. And that's it. We do not have our own associations. But we can have a center, academic center. And I said, why not? We start a, a academic center, and they, they really had a good laugh because they knew that I'm very naive, and it's, it's starting an academic center or something is not an easy thing. But I'm from a village, you know. I, I told you my journey from very, very, like my father wasn't there when I was born. My mother was very young. And, and I had to go to every step by being bold rather than by, you know, getting somebody getting me things there. So I said, well, unless we try, we never know. And so consequently, the result is we have Center for Indic Studies. Why Center for Indic Studies? Why India? And I, I, I make all these stories now. It is not exactly what I was thinking. I already told you that um, when Columbus was going to uh, his journey, he, he really was going to India. He ended up in San Salvador, and he convinced everybody that that's India. Can you imagine that how powerful he was? He convinced everybody until. I forget the name of the person who, you know, some of you might be remembering some Italian name which, is, uh, which has America in it, or uh, some, uh, that's where the, the name America comes. Until that person came who was a really uh, a geographer, uh, geography person who used to make maps, and he is the one who figured out that it's not India. And that's why we give a name to America because of his name. I can't remember his, his uh, Italian name. But more interesting thing is the Columbus was so powerful that 500 years later, we still call them Indians. The American Indians, Native Americans, are still co called as American Indians, even though we know that they are not Indian. I'm telling you, we are Indians. We came from India. <laughs> these, people, they, they, these people are not. You know, call them whatever they are, but, but with so much confusion. But nevertheless, the point is that there is a connection. This confusion, for some reason, is, has a meaning, and that at least I can talk about it today. But the other more interesting thing, so I, I tell people that we really are connected. We need to have index studies because otherwise nobody will understand. The other thing is that the Boston Tea Party, which of course happened in Boston, and the tea was from India. So we are at least have some role to play in, in American independence. But more, more interesting thing is that the name of the first ship that they threw the uh, tea uh, bags overboard was named Dartmouth. And it was really built in Dartmouth. They used to have, that time, now it is Westport. They used to have a harbor. And what is known as today as Westport Harbor was the Dartmouth Harbor. And that there is a museum in New Bedford about all this. I did not know all this, but now I say that the region we have Central Appendix Studies in UMass Dartmouth because of this, all this very ancient connection. Now, I'll give you some little bit more interesting thing why we have Indic Studies in here. Waldo, Emerson, and Henry David Thoreau were the first people who were interest in, interested in Indian philosophy. When in America became independent, Americans started doing business with India about spices. You know, you see that India point when you drive to Providence? That's where the ships used to come with spices. And when they started doing, so they, 
uh, these two scholars, they had heard about Indian philosophy. So they wanted to get some books, and they got some books from India. And of course, later on, you may have, some of you may have heard about Boston Brahmins because they used to consider themselves very elite. Um, Swami Vivekanand came first in 1893. He is the one who really brought the idea of yoga. The first person who ever mentioned on this uh, land, yoga, that was him. He came to attend a world parliament of religions in, in Chicago in 19, 1893. Uh, then Boston, Boston Vedanta Society uh, was uh, built in memory of his, his teacher by Swami Vivekananda's followers. And then Prabhu, uh, excuse me, uh, Paramhans Yoganand, some of you uh, maybe know there is a book written, it's called Autobiography of Yogi. If you have ever read it, if not, then you should Google it and you will find this is still the most popular book in terms of yoga. People still buy that. And he came to Plymouth area for first. Now they have a, a major center in Los Angeles. Swami Prabhupada, of course, you don't know this name, but you might know Hare Krishna. That's, he is the founder of Hare Krishna, and he came in 1965 he, to Boston area. He landed in New York, but he came. I, I put here Desh Pandey in 1970s. Desh Pandey is a owner of Sycamore, which is $2 billion company and in Boston. So this is, the, this is to show that there are in this all high-tech in, information technology and engineers and doctors and lawyers and professors. These are the people started coming in 70s from India. And so logical thing was to have Center for Indic Studies in 2000. And that's why we have, uh, this is the argument I provide to all other people throughout the world when they come here. I say, why we have Center for Indic Studies here, not anywhere else, because of all this. And they buy my ideas. Of course, yoga has become very popular. So we get a lot of people who come to our center's program because of yoga. We have, um, it's, it's going beyond. I mean, it's not because of we did anything. It's just people are, are using it. Um, I teach a course uh, called Science of Kriya Yoga. It, it, it meets science requirements for non-science majors. So on, this is the only yoga course in the world which is taught by a scientist, number one. Number two, it meets science requirements. I teach chemistry, physics, biology. And it, of course, you have to know the nervous system because the yoga that you're doing is related to your activating your nervous system. And then I teach them chemistry also, how to understand all that. And it's very popular course, always overfilled, always overfilled. <coughs> Excuse me. And then, uh, as a consequence, the Center <coughs> for Indic Studies publishes a journal called Light on Ayurveda. We did not initiate this. This was initiated by a registered nurse in Cape Cod and her dentist husband. Because, <coughs> excuse me, she, she was very impressed. This is Ayurveda is, means, I means life, Veda means knowledge. It's medical science, Indian medical science. In India, they have medical school, they teach all this, which includes yoga, also includes herbal medicine, like Chinese herbal medicine. And there's tons of philosophy around it to understand what is brain, how it is mind, what is your body, and all that. Very, very detailed stuff. And because of all that, now we have started for the last three years training teachers, high school teachers, about India, because this is very complex. It is not just very simple to say, well, you know, India is there, here is a map, and this is what they eat, this is what they, they dress. It's not like that. It's really very deep uh, understanding of why, what they eat. Why do they eat the spices? Can you imagine somebody who must have first convinced someone to eat chili or turmeric or black pepper and say, well, please eat, this is good for you? It's very difficult. There is a professor, Tim Walker, in history department in our campus who has done research, he does research on Portuguese um, colonies. And he did research and he told me, he showed once he was making a presentation, 12 items that Portuguese took from India and sold it in Europe. As a medicine, 12 items, and they, were, they are all spices. In India, people eat food like that because they are helpful to them. I don't drink tea for the last five years or six years, no top coffee or tea. I make a spice-based drink every morning, and I drink. And I don't take any medication. I haven't taken medication in the last 12 years. No medication. I do yoga every day. So I learned a little bit about this. I did not know all this in India. I learned here. And now I practice. The, I don't get sick. I don't take medication. 
I am always available to, to do whatever needs to be done. So there is a great philosophy to understand about your life and then you are in control. And that's what I teach in the class. Now we have been uh, doing this teacher training, high school, middle school teachers. We bring them one week on campus, all paid for by a foundation. And then we train them about Indian culture and traditions and uh, all the things about cultural as well as philosophical and practical thing that they do. We have a World Association of Vedic Studies, India's, not India's, whole world's most ancient text is called Vedas, which means, literally it means knowledge. And they have, there is a World Association of Vedic Studies that we, I'm associated with. I once in a while host them. This meeting was actually in Trinidad. They have every two years a meeting and they talk about all these things in a very scholarly way. All kind of professors and scholars join hands. We, I know this is a business class and um, we publish a journal called uh, International Journal of Cult Indian Culture and Business Management. Its, uh, it's uh, editor is Professor Angappa Gunasekaran, who is currently the dean of the business school, Charlton College of Business at our, our campus. And I help him a little bit. I mean, I'm, I'm a chemist, as you can imagine. I don't know how much I can help him with this, but I do a little bit about the culture. I, I actually we did even some small research about Indian restaurant and the, how they manage, how the traditional food versus non-traditional food, which is, means, you know, you adopt American way. And who makes more money? We just wanted to do, see who makes more profit. And we found actually those who make traditional food, they make more profit because it's cheaper, because they don't have, they have all traditional vegetarian type of th thing, which is much cheaper ingredient and they make a lot more money than somebody who adapts to, to the American uh, way of food. But very, very surprising because most people will think that it will be the other way around. Indian families are like I just gave you a little bit of uh, taste of what I am going through. I have 30 members in my family. I still consider them all to be my own. And I have my responsibility as a son, as an uncle, as a father, as a brother. All, all the responsibility, I consider them to be my responsibility. So I don't expect anything from them. I think they did their responsibility when I was growing up. And that's good enough. I, so I will do the rest of my life all the things that I can do as my responsibility, nothing to to find anything from them or expecting anything from them. This works better. It works in Asian countries because Asians in general are very family oriented. They not only respect the elders in their family, they expect, respect the ancestors. They have uh, days and months to do that. And this is ingrained into the mind that you need to respect. Being respectful is very helpful. When I came here, I'm respectful to all the authorities. And then I succeeded much better than, than if I weren't. And many times our children really do that also. We have conferences, for example, we had a, a conference on origin of Indian civilization. It's, it's a long story, the origin of Indian civilization, like I just showed you, 60, 70,000 years ago, everybody came from there. So then the, the, the question is always as to what originated where. When British were ruling India, they convinced everybody that everybody came from Europe to India because they came from Europe to India. So they thought you know, it will be easier for them to rule if they convince everybody that everybody else came from the same place also. But that's not the case. So there are issues like that. We invite all sorts of people. India is a very diverse country. It has all the religions that you can imagine in the world. And of course, there are some problems, but by far much less problem than anywhere else in the world because everybody accepts. So we have Jewish people who were, when they were persecuted everywhere else, they went to India, and no problems. People just lived there by the way they wanted to live. And this rabbi came, actually he told, I, I didn't know that much about all this, because they mostly are in South India, not in North India, I'm from North. But he has written books, and he told about the Jewish experience in India, and he found that they were uh, very happy there. Even many of them have now migrated to Israel, but the, they still keep the culture part of it, even in Israel. So we are able to get all those uh, kind of information. I also, believe it or not, I host a TV program on DCTV, the Dartmouth Cable Television, where I, when, when we have the scholars to come and, and make presentation on campus, I interview them. It's called Bartha, which means a dialogue. You, you have a dialogue. It's not like any adversarial thing. So I, we, have, we must have produced like 30 episodes 
in last uh, couple of years. We also have, uh, I'm, I'm from sciences, I'm very interested in sciences. We have uh, symposia on science, Vedanta is, is one of the Indian philosophy and foundation of physics. So it's very, I get again some, several scholars in physics, chemistry and, and different fields and we, we sit down and every summer we have several of these symposia that we do on campus. Uh, we also, I said that we do some cultural uh, programs which are always a little bit different than normally people other places, even maybe the Indians do this because of my science background. I always integrate science with everything. So Indian dance, this is, these are all the girls actually are local, they are from Boston area and <clears throat> they learn Indian classical dance. Normally they learn for five years, every week at least 10 hours practice and for five years they learn to become uh, able to perform. That's when the teacher said, now you can perform. So these girls were like mostly in high school, there were a couple of them in college and they wanted, their teacher had told that Indian dance is a language. It's a language. You need to communicate. And so the, one of the students asked, can we communicate science because he was a science student. And so I gave lectures in science to these students and then these students choreographed their dance to try to explain how the DNA works. Some of you may be familiar with this. This is the structure of a DNA. And they were uh, able to perform a DNA dance. It became very famous, actually. It was on the public radio, and it was Boston Globe. They got invitation from all over the country to go. They were only able to go a couple of places because they were students, so they couldn't go. But really, it was, it was beautiful. So we do that. We also um, de get into much deeper philosophy. I, I, uh, in India, you know, people think India philosophy, they think maybe it's a religion. I find that there in India there is no religion. It's all only philosophy or tradition or because everything is acceptable. It is acceptable to negate God or abuse God or not accept God or have your own God or consider yourself God. So it's like, you know, e almost everything is acceptable. Now this, I just uh, put two, one physicist, one um, biologist, actually he was a biophysicist. He was almost mentor to him, He's a, and he writes some of the things, I'm going to read this for you. Um, the many conscious egos from whose mental experiences the one world is concocted. Now he's a physicist, he's a known, he's a Schrodinger, Schrodinger baby question, if anybody is here in the, from physics or sciences. He's very famous in 1936, I think he got Nobel Prize. Now, but he said there is, this, there is obviously only one alternative, namely the unification of minds or consciousness. Their multiplicity is only apparent. In truth, there is only one mind. This is the doctrine of Upanishads. Upanishads are one of those Vedas I just told earlier. He had read about them because, and that, that is really a long talk to give with why yoga and with yoga and then meditation, if you get there, what, what is the fundamental purpose of yoga and meditation? We think is health. The yoga philosophy doesn't say that. It says to know. To know you have to be unbiased. And by practicing yoga and meditation, you become unbiased. And the reality shows to you. That's how these books were written, apparently. And so it is very difficult for people to understand today that some of these things there were said, but when there are somebody at that high level who is looking at this, understanding this, so this is what a physicist says. And this is, um, Crick says, uh, differently, he, he talks about you know religion. How the people uh, have uh, the religious people did not even know how long, how old was Earth. You know, just a few hundred years ago, they were thinking this only 4,000 years old if the Earth was flat and this things like that. So he uses he goes against religion. This is not a religion. That's what I'm trying to say. This is if this is the philosophy. It's available for every religion. Anybody just basically has to, if yoga is not something that, I think yoga is against religion. When my students ask me, what, what, what do you think yoga and religion is? I think yoga ultimately is against religion. It, it, but it's not against one religion, it's against all religions because it empowers you. Religion is normally you get together and then you work together. But of whatever religion that is, whatever your beliefs are, in, in India also they have some beliefs, some people have some beliefs, but then it, it's not like, Exclusive. You cannot have exclusive. In, in Japan, just to give you an idea, in Japan, they did survey of different religions. They found it total came out to be 155% of people because some people believe in more than one thing. 
So you ask them whether you're Buddhist, they say, yeah. You say, yeah, you are Shinto, they say, yes. So India is actually probably will come out to be 800% because many people believe in many things. It's not something, but yoga is something that gives you away from, it empowers you. You don't need to have necessarily God. If you need, you have a God, it's fine too, but you don't need necessarily to have that. So in that sense, it ultimately, for me, from where I stand, and sometimes I am, I'm born Hindu, and sometimes my Hindu friends are not very happy with what I say. But like I said, in India, it's yoga is an Indian thing, so I can I at least speak of that. It's basically the idea is to, for you to know the reality as it is by being totally unbiased, which yoga t tells you to become detached. Or if you want like, to be attached, you, can, you cannot be detached, very difficult. Then you attach to everything the same, everything. I cannot distinguish any one of you, those of you who are of my children's age, from my children. If I do that, then I'm, I'm, I'm doing yoga. But if I discriminate, I say, oh, that's my son, I need to, oh, this guy is from India, this guy is from Fall River, that guy. If I started telling, the, then I'm not doing yoga. I'm by being biased, I wouldn't know about you. If I wanted to know about you, I have to treat you just like my own children. If I did that, there was actually a problem in my family. My, my daughter, my, excuse me, my wife said that you should stop being professor once you get home. See, you give too much lectures to kids, which I think is very common. I said, uh, I, I said, okay, I will do that. How about I treat all my students as my children then? So I, I treat all my students as my children. So because I, it is very difficult for me to say something else, what I think is important, different for my kids versus for my students. For, for me, they are the same. If I'm going to teach, I'm going to teach the same thing, whether you are my kid or my student. I'm not a perfect person. I am I obviously I'm just a human being. I have my own weaknesses. The point I'm trying to yoga is that either you detach completely or attach to everything the same. Because then you are not biased and you will you will know the truth. Only then you will know the truth. And that's the idea that these noble laureates were debating. There is a, a concept talking about multiplicity. There is a concept in, in Sanskrit it's called Eko Aham Bahusyami, which means I am the one but is expressed in so many ways. So then in some sense, this is a philosophy now. I say that all of you are me. You are just ex, ex, my extension of me. Then, I, I, then it makes much easier for me to consider everybody to be the same. Because then now, now are all part of me. I'm, I, it is only my thought, maybe not your thought, but the point is I will not discriminate anyone because you are all part of me. So that is the, the philosophy that they have, and that helps. So I'm, I'm getting to the end. Um, I got about five minutes here. And the fundamental knowledge is very important. There are so many ways to get that fundamental knowledge. Yoga is one of them. I think at least the idea of being unbiased and detached is very important. That then gets converted into science, scientific understanding, which is what people like me do. And then that becomes expressed in material manifestation, which is, uh, this is a, an example of 1,600 old metal pillar has not rusted. It's still in Delhi. It has not rusted for 1,600 years. So they had some technology which we don't understand. Some of my colleagues in my department are working on it right now, trying to understand. Uh, or they have, uh, there is a history channel. If you do uh, something about planes, airplanes, you will find on history channel, there is a, uh, a story about India where they think that they ha used to have planes at one time. And they used to have mercury as a, as a fuel, not, not the fossil fuel. Or we are doing uh, some research ourselves where we are using metals, processed metals as nanomedicine. That has been done in India for 2,500 years or so. And now we are, we are doing some electron microscopy and other things to do that. And of course, there is a yoga and Ayurveda treatment of people who have otherwise diseases and they have to be uh, treated. I, I want to end my, my discussion on one issue, which is about women. It's very, very controversial everywhere in the world, in India also. Of course, in, in India, we, uh, girls, if we want to find out the number of in female engineers, you will find the highest in India. Or maybe in China also, I don't know about that. But, but in India, the, most of the female students at UMass Dartmouth who are engineering students, they're all from India. Because generally, it is not thought that females are less than males. That is not to say there is no problem in the society, but generally it is 
thought that they are capable of doing that. So there are a lot of, this is a representation of uh, uh, girls these days who are uh, working at the call center and they are very highly educated. At the same time, they are also very keeping their tradition. You know, this, is dress, this dress shows that they are very traditional. But highest amount of respect to women in India is given to mothers. It's because of the motherhood is the key. That this is the, the, the richest industrialist in India. He died. He has two sons. And, and the mother is still there. And the two sons don't get along. They fight with each other. They are the, still the richest people in India. It's like Bill Gates in, in this country. But only when they get too far, mother puts her foot down and says, that's what you're going to do. And that's what they do. Actually, even Supreme Court told the mother to intervene because the, nobody else was able to intervene. They have so much power. That's what I'm trying to tell. And this is very important for me. There is, because people say there is a woman behind every successful man. There may be a man behind every successful woman. We will know when Hillary Clinton, when Hillary Clinton uh, contests election next time, and we'll see how that goes. Um, but there is always a mother behind every successful human being. When it, uh, Abraham Lincoln said, everything I am or ever hope to be, I owe to my angel mother. And just to give you a sense, in India, mothers have a huge role. My mother was, had become widow, but she was, she was always, this is my brother getting married. There is a ceremony where mother is very important role to play. She says mother puts her, uh, leg in the uh, uh, well, the water well, and says, I'm going to die because you, you're getting married now. Who will take care of me? So then the, the, the groom is supposed to lift her out of there and say, I will take care of you for the rest of my life. Please come back. And so that's, that's a ceremony of because you, you're getting married, and they want to make sure that you, your mother is not forgotten. My mother was, was here in the United States, and I tried to do everything. She's no more in this world. But it's, I'm, I'm clipping her nails. So you, you know, it is considered a privilege that if you can serve your own mother. And I was very lucky, even though I had to come here that far. But I was able to spend some time when she was able to visit me. Also, I have, my mother used to cry every time I left. Because you know, in, in old days in India, if you leave for a, you know, maybe 100 miles away, because people used to walk, and then they never, sometimes they never know whether they're coming back. So mothers used to cry for their kids, because they would not know whether he will ever come back. So she had this thing in her in head wired up. So every time I go to Delhi for my education, every time she sits there and cries. So I came back once. I said, I'm not going, unless you stop crying. And, so she, and I said, I promise that I will return. Every time you need me, I will return. And so last uh, week of her life, when, when the time came, I got a call, and I got on the plane. I was able to spend a week with her. I think I felt so satisfied that I kept my word with my mother. And, and so I, I want to end at this. I have a few other slides, but that's not important. I want to talk a little bit about the, the rest of Asia and how that is are related, but maybe for another time. Thank you very much for your attention. I will be pleased to answer any questions. The first question is, uh, you mentioned that Botox is very dangerous. Yes. Why did the FDA allow Botox to be killing you? It's, uh, it's a, well, the real issue is that it's dose. How much? How much? It's very dangerous. You know, I, I have a couple of slides where it says salt is very dangerous. You know, if, how much salt do we eat a day? Does anyone know? Too much. Too much? Too much. In terms of uh, how much amount? Ramen. How much? Ramen. Ramen. That, that's the amount ramen. That's the amount ramen. It's about ten, 5 to 10 grams. F 5 to 10 grams of salt everybody eats every day. If you multiply that by 10, even, so if you eat 800 grams of salt, you probably would not survive the day. So there was actually there is a story. There was a bet in India. There was a teacher who ate one pound salt, and he didn't survive. He died. A couple years ago, you may have heard in, in, in uh, Oregon, there was a competition of water drinking, or there is a competition. And there's a, this lady died who drank, who won the competition, but died ultimately. So even water is poisonous. 
Now, saying that, now what, what happens with botulinum Botox is that if you use a picogram, which is a trillionth of a gram, then it's a medicine. If you use a billionth of a gram, then it's a poison. So the FDA allows that. That's because what happens that when you when, when they inject, it's only available locally. So it only relaxes your muscles locally, not systemically. If it is systemic, then you die. And what happens normally the, the, the muscles that you're breathing a diaphragm, the cage muscles are the ones which get attacked if you have too much of it, which is like a billionth of a gram is too much of it. And so that is where the window is. Every medicine, as you know, is a poison if you take too much of it. So that's, that's how it works. Yes? How is it even possible to inject a trillion? You said a trillion? A trillion of, of a gram. That's like on a molecular level. Yeah, it is possible to see the, in chemistry, one, uh, it depends on what molecules we have, but uh, let's say a gram could be as much as 10 to the power 23, you know, Avogadro's number, some of you who are familiar with chemistry, that many molecules, that's one molar. This is, is still in femtomolar, which means, it's, it's, I mean, it's still, when, when we inject, uh, a, let's say, 10, 20 picogram, we are still talking about 10 to the power 15 molecules. Well, that is a lot, lot of molecules, but not as much as Avogadro's number. So how do they do it? Of course, we produce in some milligram quantity in our lab, and then you dilute it. You dilute it to a million times, and then you package it after that, and then the doctors can inject. So it's, a, it's just a simple chemistry allows all this. Any other question? Yeah? Um, you said before that um, with your family you treat, you know, your, even your nephews and your cousins or somewhat as your own children. Yeah. And does that commitment also go towards the family that you married into? Um, to a certain degree, not as much. It's, uh, the, so it's, it's not, it does, the, the commitment is to only your family. The system is very well established. Um, when there is need, yes, but it's not given. It's like so my in-laws, if of course they need, no, normally, uh, again, traditionally, when people marry their daughters in some family, in this, they will go to the extent that they will not even drink water from the well of that family. It, it, not every, every region in India does that, but largely they do this. So they, when they give a daughter in a family, they don't want to take anything in return. This may have some bad history in the past, because people selling their daughters, for example, but for money. So the society sometimes does over this thing. And so their idea was that we would not want to take anything from that family. So my, when I, I remember my, uh, my uh, grandfather, when they will come, my mother's uncle, he, see, he, I did not see my mother's father, but his uncle will come. They will come and they will stay the whole day. They will see my mother and then they will go back because they would not eat in our family. They, they, they had something like that. But that's one extreme of the case. But if they ever needed, like my grandmother, when she needed us, we took care of just like we will take care of our own family. Actually, we brought her to our home, and we took care of her in our home. Uh, and, uh, I want to thank Dr. Singh for coming here. It's a privilege and an honor to have him on campus. And also, uh, thank you, President Sprague, for making it to the presentation. And it's very nice of President Sprague. And uh, to Samad Adams for allowing us to uh, use his classroom for the presentation. Um, the next event for us is um, for Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. It's for Chancellor Davina Kruzman to be here on campus. So it's going to be this Wednesday um, in L101. So if you can make it to that presentation, it will be amazing. Um, she's one of the few present uh, college presidents in this country that's of Asian descent. There are only 10 of them in the country out of four, over 1,400 or so uh, colleges. So please go there if you can. Um, this Wednesday from 3.30 to 4.30. And it's an L101 on campus. She, she's a chancellor of my colleague. Uh, you <laughs> the new chancellor. <laughs> Thank All you, right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.